So I'll start posting the recordings sometime, sometime by the end of this week. Um, well, actually, I'll try to do that before I leave today. I need to get them up and running, get y'all situated for the test. So... So when last we left, we were talking about the reasons of channel intensity and what are some of the decisions that you make when you're balancing this. Remember that channel intensity also is correspondingly with channel selectivity. Um, and one of the reasons why you're selective about the channel as a manufacturer is that you have greater advantages having fewer distributors rather than more. And the biggest one, of course, is the control of the brand and the way the brand is given, no problem, is distributed to the consumer. And so in the trading of territory exclusivity for category exclusivity, it basically what this does is it confirms this connection of basically saying, all right, I'm giving you this area, this is yours. I am dependent upon you to be able to sell in this area, but it also means that on the other side as well, it means they have to have a greater connection with the manufacturer if they're going to have that kind of, of um, um, power. Strong manufacturers refrain, refrain from maximizing coverage. They do that to be able to make the brand stronger, not weaker. And these are in cases where the brand needs to be stronger. If we're talking about a convenience good where simply any outlet is its, is its greatest value, a Coke, you can go in anywhere and buy a Coke, then the brand is not contingent on controlling the supply. Especially shopping goods, especially selective goods, those goods require some particular control. Now, let's also talk about the trade area. Excuse me, I've got that next, my bad. We've also got to talk about the competitive, no, no, this is it, the competitive intensity of the area that you're in. So here in Boone, we have 20,000 people. We have in the general Watauga County area, 45,000 or whatever. There is a substantial population here but in terms of competitive intensity in this area, we, in essence, in many ways, live on an island. Um, we are separated by boundaries between cities. And so for us, the competitive intensity is weaker. However, if we go down to Hickory, we're in an area of a five-county seat with 362,000 people in it. Um, Lots of industry, which is one of the reasons why App State is there. Um, the importance of that market and the competitive intensity makes for a different environment. A manufacturer may not be making a lot of money, but if we're not in Hickory, we might be in trouble. Krispy Kreme decided in its infinite wisdom to close in Boone to the sorrow of everyone who loves their donuts. And they also closed in Lenore as well, but they could not leave here. Hickory is a hub. It's a location. It's a central location. Interestingly enough, it's the largest single population without a four-year university, and that's why we're there, right? The dynamics, especially with shopping goods in Hickory, because it is a gathering place also means that as a distributor, I don't want to limit the brands I category. Even if that category is not necessarily, that particular brand is not necessarily a money lender, but it is vitally important that you carry it. We did not sell a lot of Mitsubishi T TVs when I was at Cons, but the fact that we sold them in the first place gave our entire line a certain amount of value.
And so the opportunity cost, which basically is the cost of not being in an area, has to be understood. What do I give up if I'm not there? It's one thing for a big lots to close here, sadly. Um, but it's another thing for a big lots to close in a place like Hickory. The, um, the alarm bells that it sends out everywhere are ones that may be too big to ignore. And so opportunity cost. How important is it to be there? What do we lose if we're not? And then finally, how is it expensive is it to trade? Is our particular product a very high-end, expensive product that requires a significant infrastructure and investment for our particular distributors to be able to be in the game? So I worked offshore, um, I worked on the boats, um, and I worked with a lot of uh, transportation when I was in Louisiana. And I worked for a company called Oilfield Warehouse, and we sold a lot of stainless steel tubing. Um, quarter inch stainless steel, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but Stainless steel is vital, especially when you're in areas um, that have high sodium content, salt water, all right? Stainless steel does not degrade. Iron will rust. Iron takes one ton of steel and turns it into three tons of rust very quickly. Stainless steel is vital. A quarter inch stainless steel connector that big in 1980. One dollars was seventy-five dollars. Can you imagine what a quarter-inch stainless steel fitting like that costs now? And then think about the thousands that have to be on an oil rig. This is an example of the cost that it takes. So instead of having one distributor, or let's just say multiple distributors who have difficulties with economies of scale, which you might choose as one master district. It means that I have fewer entities that I have to deal with. It means lower transaction costs. There are enormous advantages of this and where oil field warehouse could not possibly foot the bill of $800,000 for a single order for a company like Kermagi or Harima. What we could do is we could partner with another company called Moody Price. They can collect all of our requirements together, go to uh, people like Swedgelock and all the others that make stainless steel, buy for us, and they would store it and warehouse it for us. Remember, one of, the, one of the things about efficient channels is that you have more specialized members in the channel. And so this is the other reason. The last is there are other strategies as well, and the biggest one is brand building. If I have a strong, powerful brand, then I am more likely to tolerate intra-brand competition and refrain from those destructive habits. I think there are like four distributors of steel tools in this area, I can't remember, and yet they all live together in perfect harmony because the steel brand is so powerful that basically there's plenty of room for everybody.
And so not only do you accept intra-brand competition, but you don't have to worry about things for bait and switch because there's plenty for everybody to make money off. And so these are all the reasons or how we go about making de decisions on brand intensity, or excuse me, channel intensity. How many different out, excuse me, how many outlets that you have total? So we are going from channel intensity, which is the number of outlets out there, to channel type, which is the number of different outlets. And so by channel type, what we are meaning is different channels. And by different channels, what do I mean? I mean retail, wholesale, online, buy online, pick up in store. All of these kiosk, all of those are examples of what we consider to be different types of channels, all right? Now, remember in chapter two, when we talked about market segmentation, one of the things or the reasons that we come up with the different ways is that we have a broader number of ways to be able to attract different people. Each channel type uses a distinct process to select, purchase, order, and receive products. Each outlet will have different functions, different price points, and different advantages and different different disadvantages. The purpose is to raise the coverage to gain greater market, but not necessarily to have more than one way that a consumer wants to deal uh, with the products themselves. So I gave the Blockbuster example. So, as I said before, you'll never have an idea of what kind of phenomenon it was for for um, Blockbuster. For about a five or 10 year part of that decade, people were planning how to get off early from, from work, get out 30 minutes earlier so they could beat the line at the Blockbuster that would snake around the store itself. It was crazy. It's just, it's hard to express it. But it's like any kind of bad you know, when everybody kind of catches on, but they went to the Blockbuster, they hoped that their uh, their tape or their uh, DVD was up on. They also had candy, they had all sorts of other things. They may even be showing one while they're in the Blockbuster. From about 4.30 to 8 o'clock, it was jammed in a Blockbuster. It was crazy. And yet that changed overnight. Um, when at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2001, I can't remember, um, this little company with a little red box came out and said, why do you have to go to the Blockbuster and run all that way when we could just put it in front of every drugstore in the United States? My, my, matter of fact, why don't we put two so there's no waiting? And literally overnight, Blockbuster changed forever. Why? Well, the big thing to realize is, is it not just necessarily that they were trading the Blockbuster store for the Red Box, but they were exactly getting exactly the service that they wanted. People found they didn't like standing in lines. They could buy their popcorn at a regular store during the week when they didn't, when it was less expensive. All right. You could change your habits and get the DVD you wanted at any time without waiting in lines. And, you know, Blockbuster, to their credit, tried to change. They came up with the blue box, but it was simply too late. You got to realize Blockbuster was such a huge um, company. It was sponsoring stadiums 
I mean, that's how big. They had Blockbuster Stadium in Miami, the, the Orange Bowl, right? And all of that was wiped out by simply providing the consumer with a different way to get stuff, all right? That's basically what this little item has done. It's the same thing. It has profoundly changed the way. And, and perhaps it's not, in essence, profoundly because you're the ones that are doing it, but it you provided you with a venue, with a way of providing your own best personal choice. And that's what the advantage of this little device has done. Not only that, and I say this all the time, you're the toughest consumer group that has ever come out, all right? Because you have knowledge at your hands. And so all of those things have really created a paradigm shift when it comes to selling. And basically, right now, we're having to catch up with you. I don't know if we ever will. So different channel types, you provide better service, all right? It expands the channels of the manufacturers if they're clever enough. And however, you might expect there to be a little cannibalization. It just goes with the territory. Cannibalization is when you route products out of one channel and give it to another. Happens, all right? You got to be very careful about these channel types as well because they can, it, it is a natural source of conflict because the traditional channels, the current ones that are there, are not going to just sit and let things go by. Any golfers in here, by the way? Okay. Anybody ever heard of Callaway Clubs? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a name that's strong. The Callaway Club, when it originally came out, was an item that was built to you. The Callaway Club, when it originally came out, you would go to a pro shop and you would get measured. They would measure your stance. They would measure your waist, your instep. They would measure how you swung. They measured all of these things, and you got a custom-fitted set of clubs at a slightly outrageous price. 2008, 2009 comes along, and Callaway decides they're going to try to start selling online, and golf clubs erupt. Why? Because golf clubs do not make money on green fees. Golf clubs make money on the pro shops. And so what they were doing was, in essence, threatening the lives of everyone out there that ran those stores. And so you had this eruption. We'll talk about conflict, and this comes into it as well. Um, they came up with a solution that if you bought the clubs online, you had to go to the pro shop to get them fitted. So we came up with a solution. And so channel types is a very disruptive environment, but it's one that basically you have to live with, all right? They can have positive side effects and negative ones. It is the understanding that the basically that the market is fragmented. So you, you darn buyers, you just go out there and you make things confusing, all right? You cherry pick, all right? You create channel pollution. You go online, you do information searches, you go to the stores. Which channel are you using? Pick a link. You know, you use the internet to negotiate because you can say, hey, I've got this price for dollars cheaper, including the shipping. I'll still make it, but it'll be less for me. But what also happens is that the net effect is, is that maybe as your margin share, it decreases, the market itself increases. And so in essence, your little piece of the pie, the money that you get will remain consistent. Yes, it makes it hard for us to do research and understand where our consumers are. But hey, cost of doing business. You will not have to worry about the selection process of channel members. We're going to bail on that. And now we're going to talk about dual distribution. So as I said before, North Carolina is famous for dual distribution, especially with their, um, with their furniture manufacturing 
through Broyhill and all the others. Um, when I, when my friends and I were starting to outfit our homes and we were in our 20s in the 80s, um, the first place we came to is North Carolina because North Carolina, we could buy directly from the store, get it shipped to Mississippi, and it's still less expensive than going to that store. It was so lucrative that you could actually drive to North Carolina, spend a week up here, find your furniture, get it delivered at home, and still beat your local dealership. Dual distribution means that the manufacturer itself is going to market through the traditional channel structure, third parties, and you are creating your own distribution division. It is like being in the horizontal market and the vertical market at the same time. Now, it is a natural place for conflict. Why? This is a test answer or test question coming up. Why? When third parties compete, the manufacturers can claim to be neutral. They can say that as long as you hit certain targets with your volume, that you can achieve certain discounts. The problem with dual distribution and its place in conflict is that the claim of neutrality is no longer valid. In a dual distribution system, your claim for neutrality is no longer valid. You've got a skin in the game just as much as the furniture retailer does. Now, how do you balance this if you're a manufacturer? One of it is that you do it with strong brand recognition so that you can make your money just as well as your distributors do. You compete directly with the channel partners that you're trying to get them to distribute your goods. And yet corporations do this over and over. Well, why? Why really? Why do you go through all of this? Well, there are valid reasons. Before I go on, the example that AT&T, so AT&T, um, in 1986, the Communications Act, Communication Act of 1986, basically broke up what was known as the Bell Company. So in the 20th century, um, the Bell Company was a monopoly within the United States that handled all telephones across the U.S. They had multiple divisions. They had Bell Labs. They had Western Electric. They had South Central Bell, all the other corporations, but they were all part of at and In 1986, the government made them break those up and allow private corporations to provide those same services, and that's where we are today. Well, in the 90s, when all of this was going on, you also saw corporations, unique ones, become what are called value-added resellers. And so they would buy the equipment from AT&T. They would take their software into their telephone systems and create unique systems such as a banking system or a system for a doctor or those kind of things. And they created these specialized niches. And so... The dual systems were difficult because now AT&T and all these value-added resellers are out there as well. The value-added resellers have these strong partnerships with the corporations that they have, but they live together in a somewhat 
believable way, all right? What is interesting now is that they have all expanded out now, and now there's so many corporations that basically in 2000 to 2010, AT&T grabbed all the baby bills back together, and now we're back to where they were, except they don't have 100% of the business, all right? So this is an example. But there are potential, there are valid arguments. One of them is the demonstration argument. What if I want to use this to my advantage and I can show the independent channels what is the best way to sell my particular product? I can create what are known as flagship stores at expensive locations that carry an exclusive depth of those particular items that are available for others. And so anybody ever go through an airport and see a bunch of watches or anything else like that? That's an example of a flagship store. It's there just as much to try to catch the eye of an individual as it is it also is a location to show how independent distributors can do it right. It's also a way for a manufacturer to have a better understanding of its target market. There is a concept known as performance ambiguity. Performance ambiguity is the uncertainty as to whether or not I am effectively dealing with a market based upon the restrictions of being disconnected from my customers. In a traditional channel system, the manufacturers here, the wholesalers, the retailers, and then finally the consumers, and going through those particular venues, there's the difficulty of losing some interpretation of what the consumers think of my product. And so if I can reduce that, if I get a better understanding of what my consumers want, then there's a greater chance that I can satisfy their needs. And so we have all of these. We have intensity, type, and we have dual distribution. Now we talked about the gaps. How do we take all of these and reduce the gaps that we had talked about in chapter three? So. As we talked about with the zero-based channel concept, the zero-based concept says that we try to meet all of the service output demands at a minimum cost. We do our best to lower our expenses as much as we can. And for marketers to be talking about this, they're gonna go wash my mouth out with soap because we're not supposed to talk about cost, but here we are, okay? But we can't deny if we're losing money by being inefficient, that basically what we're doing is we're failing to provide the customer with what we need and even making them pretty ticked off at us. We may be providing more. And so those people in Blockbuster may have loved going there, but at some point, like everything, you know, you're just tired of it. And this is one of those issues that Blockbuster had is the failure to close these gaps because they didn't understand where the gaps existed. And so we have the service gaps where the service supplied is greater or less than the service demanded. The cost gap where we're spending too much money. And then also we have the environmental and managerial bounds, those that those limitations that are inside organizations and those limitations that are outside of the environment. How do we close those gaps? So 
So the first is closing the service gaps. If I'm at Blockbuster and I'm looking at all the things that I am delivering and I suddenly realize my customers are standing in line not because of all the things that I have, but in spite of all the things I have, then what I want to do is reduce or attract the service outputs provided until I right tune things to the way consumers want them. And so perhaps at Blockbuster, maybe I double the amount of items that I have to sell. Maybe I start to have five lines or if they even had the technology self-service lines. Because the real question is, how do we satisfy what the consumers really want? The next thing is that even though consumers may not want everything at one time, maybe they want more. So then what I can do is offer a menu of service outputs. This is one of the things that airlines do quite well. As a matter of fact, they've gotten out of the one size fits all. And anyone who's ever had the dubious pleasure of flying on Spirit knows it's a little bit different than flying on American or Southwest or Delta. But you have a menu or many different ways that you can fly. There are some minimum standards, of course. You know, if you're doing an international flight, you absolutely expect to be able to check a bag. You absolutely expect to have a couple of meals. Um, but if you're doing shuttle flights or anything like that, you can bail on those for a cheaper ticket. Anybody ever fly on Spirit? Where'd you go? I'm just curious. Um, in high school, the cheer team would always fly Spirit. To... Cool. Do you, do you have any idea how much it cost or anything like that? Um, I want to say it was less than $100 for a ticket. Right. But but I'm not like exactly sure. Spirit will do things, by the way, if you ever get into flying, where they will do like, oh gosh, what would you call it? Um, um, mob tickets, where they would just throw out a price like a day before a flight of something ridiculous. My my brother has flown, my, my brother has a daughter in, in Colorado and he's flown to Colorado twice on tickets costing $25, okay? Just fill the seat. All right. Now, it means you got to be able to take off from a moment's notice. But if you have that as a service output, then then that's a value to you. All right. Now, you know, don't expect, you know, comfort or don't expect, you know, bring your own water is a good thing and buy a candy bar on your way. But a twenty five dollar ticket. I mean, my God, you know, that's crazy. So, yeah, that that's an example. You give a menu of items. OK. And the last is that you can fine tune that target segment. You can differentiate those uh, elements. You can try to just tweak them a little bit so that it, it's exactly what consumers want. And so you do see this return back into the airline industry of some of the amenities that consumers like. Um, the truth is, is that, as I've said before, three quarters of the price of a ticket is all about the fuel costs. And so if you actually flip the model and look at it, the cost of other little things is very little, but you never know what you're going to be able to bring. And so these are how you go about adjusting for the service gaps. The cost gaps are can only generally be closed, unfortunately, by sometimes removing the most expensive thing in the entire environment, which is reducing the roles of the channel members. So the wholesalers and the retailers and those kind of things. Now, remember, you can reduce the number of members, but you cannot reduce the functions. So if you take a member out of the system, you have to make sure the functions are still being done. Now you can invest in new distribution technologies. So now even when I go to Dollar General, they have kiosk, which I think is brilliant. Um, 
you can change the distribution function specialists. They can improve the channel functioning. So one of the things, medical office systems, um, in the 80s, you saw this big push in refining medical office environments. And you have no idea what has gone on in, in medical offices over the last 40 years. When you step in now, it's just amazing. I'm going to get my knee replaced in spring. And now they scan the knee. The doctor comes in and the pictures are all up there. There are no more plates anymore. And it's just, it's, it's fascinating to me what has happened. In the efficiencies of an office management system, don't ask doctors how to do it. That's not their job. Their job is to take care of people. And more than one doctor has lost significant amount of money because of their, uh, basically their accounts receivable. It, it's always been bad. Rule of thumb is that if a doctor's bill is over 60 days, you can write it off because it's not going to get paid. So what they started doing was, is in the 90s, you started to see corporations going to the doctors and saying, we'll do everything for you. We'll do the bill pay. We'll do the filings. Oh, my God, just, just the filings for insurance themselves, all right? All of those things, we'll do all of those for you. We'll even take care of the uncollectibles. All you have to do is give us 6% of the total revenue. That's it. And we'll take care of everything. So what would a doctor not do but that when especially their accounts receivable, let's just say 40% of their accounts receivable is over 90 days. It's just not their job. They don't do it that well. All right. Well, they close the cost gap by investing in new technologies. And now we've got a whole new situation where the doctors do the one thing that they're supposed to do. And that's doc. It's kind of amazing. My doctor is Dr. Anderson. And I had heard one time, now this is the new world of doctors. I heard he did 13 surgeries a day. And I said, how is that even possible? And he says, the way that they do it now in the modern surgery techniques, when you go in a hospital, when you do surgery, there's actually four other surgeries going on at the same time. And what there is, is there's a field of specialists now in hospitals that do nothing but open the person up, you know, make take, take care of the anesthesia, prepped everything so that when the doctor goes in, all they do is their one particular, particular specialty, and then they move on to the next patient. Then they move on to the next patient, and then the next patient. And I, here we are, specialization and what it does in, in medicine. And it's just fascinating to me. Once again, an efficient system has special specialists in it. And this is an example. Okay, closing the cost gaps. And last, how do we close environmental and managerial? Well, some of them can be relaxed. Yes, maybe. But environmental bounds may not be able to. You can't simply change the environment in which you live in. Designing a channel structure may be impossible. Managerial bounds, yes, if you change the managers. And just remember this, challenging those bounds and the closing of them cost money. Places the most expensive and the most difficult to change. And so if you're closing gaps, you must weigh the bottom dollar every time. And so if I were looking at this as a test question, um, you won't see any specific way on how to do it, but you may see a question that says whether or not it's feasible or not. Putting your dollar in its best place may give you serendipitous events. In other words, you know, things that happened that you weren't expecting. But you can't bring them out and hope, well, hope that they're going to do all the changing. Okay. Well, I'm running out of voice. Um, we are finished with chapter five.
So we will have all of these posted. These, this is the total lecture for chapters four and chapter five. So you'll use the three you know, lectures that we'll have posted. Um, the test, I believe I said, is next Tuesday, okay, the 28th. So if any of you have any issues or anything like that, just please let me know. 29th, that's right. Thank you, 29th. Okay, yeah, we're going to do it on Halloween. Okay, thanks. All right, folks, have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day.